Welcome everybody to the. No, I, we're Kennedy, and Bill is a managing partner at Adam Labs, Miami, Florida, mobile web and systems development company. He's also co author of the Flow and Action book and author of the GoingGo.net blog and founding member of GoBridge. And yeah, so many know him from conferences or other things. So please welcome, and we will hear more about the blog proposal for generics. So thanks, and please start. Thank you. All right, it is 36 minutes after the hour. That's my mark. So I'm going to make a hard stop sometime between 35 and 40 minutes after the hour. My goal is to share as much of the new draft syntax as I can with you. Um, with that being said, I've dropped three links into the chat window. The first one is a link to the repo that you should be seeing now um, on your screens. Uh, there are 11 examples there. I will only be able to get through the first five and really Seven would make it absolutely complete, but five is gonna be good enough. That's all we're gonna have time for. So the other, um, the other examples there are for you to look at um, on your own. Uh, the second link is a link to the draft document. And uh, if that's something you wanna read, uh, it's right there. And the third link is a link to a survey from the Go team. And um, it's your opportunity to provide feedback to the team, it's anonymous, and it's really for a lot of people who are not comfortable expressing their opinions, like myself, on the mailing list or in GitHub. Um, and the language team is reading everything that you submit on that survey. So uh, if you have things you wanna share, that's an opportunity for you to directly talk to Robert, Ian, and the rest of the group that's working on this. Now on your screen, you'll see the training repo. That's the first link that I provided. And in the readme, if I, as I scroll down, you'll have a link to the draft document right here. You're seeing that come up. Uh, this talk is really about making, giving as many people as I can access to this without having to really sit down and read it. It's not a bad read, but it can get technical at times. There's also a playground link right here in the README. I won't be using the playground. I'm gonna be running everything locally as you will see. But the playground gives everybody an opportunity to experiment with the new syntax. This playground is constantly being updated with bug fixes or anything new that is found. So it's always fairly up to date. Okay, great. And if you have examples that you wanna share with me after the talk, the best thing to do is put them into the playground share those links with me on the chat. It is much easier to do that. Now, the current implementation of the draft, and this is important, is just a tool, which we call a transpiler. And the idea is to take this existing syntax that I'm gonna be showing you, transpiling it, transpiling it to actual Go code that can be built and run. There is no actual implementation of this syntax in the compiler today. We're not at that stage. Right now, what we're working on is the syntax aspect. And when that seems to be solid and everyone is happy with that, then the language team will start to focus on how do we actually implement this stuff in the compiler. I can talk more about that when I'm done. I have stolen from the draft document, the high level overview of what is currently um, listed as supporting or what, the, what the, the language is looking to support for the first release of generics when that comes out. This is a living document, so this could absolutely change one way or the other. I'm not gonna read this, but this is a, a lot of what I'm gonna be showing you over the next hour. I also stole the emissions list. I'm not gonna read this. This is things that are absolutely, well, I should say, these are things that are not currently slated to be in the first release. Uh, again, that could change if something comes up where it's recognized as something is absolutely necessary for the first release. A lot of people like to ask me, when is this first release going to happen? All I can tell you is 
the absolute soonest it could happen is probably version 117, which would be the August release next year. I would expect if everything goes well, we're probably looking at 118 in the February release of uh, 22. Um, but it's going to be somewhere between, I'd say, 17, 18, 19, if everything goes well. That's kind of the goal. And again, maybe nothing happens because we just can't find the right syntax uh, for the language. There is some extra reading here, and I do have instructions for pulling down the go to go tooling from the Go source code and building that locally, which is what I'm going to be doing here. And so you can see here that I follow those same instructions. And when I type Go version, I'm not running 115. I'm running a version uh, from source from uh, today, all right? which I haven't really tested anything against. So I expect everything to be fine anyway. So we'll be running everything locally in the terminal window um, today. OK, great. With all that being said, and time always being against us, let's jump into the new syntax. All right, so back over here in VS Code. And let's start with understanding the syntax, why we need a new syntax to begin with, what are some of the constraints that we have, and remembering that backwards compatibility is so critically important to the language team that uh, right now nothing's going to happen that isn't backwards compatible with uh, the language. We talk about a 2.0 of Go, and at least with generics, that's not going to break the 1.0 compatibility promise. And I really do hope, at least in my working lifetime, uh, there never is a 2.0 and the language doesn't fork. At least maybe I'll retire by then and uh, Natalie will have that burden, not me. <laughs> that being said, let's jump in. Okay, I want to work through the syntax as a progression to begin with so we can really understand why we need a new syntax and, and, and how it fits in. And again, we're talking about the, the current draft. So nothing is absolutely written in stone, but you're seeing where we are right now today. So let's say I wanted to write a function that can print a slice or a collection of numbers, right? So you can see here on line 13, I've written a print numbers function. It accepts a slice of integers as its parameter. And essentially in five lines of code um, with a linear traversal using our four range mechanics, I could go ahead and iterate uh, you know, over that um, collection of integers and display each integer uh, with a space, right? Five lines of code, I can write that. And if I wanted to write the same sort of behavior, but do it with a, a string, well, since the arguments are changing, the type information is changing from a slice of int to a slice of string, I have to write a new function. But it's essentially the same five lines of code. It's the headers. It's a four range linear traversal. The only thing that's really changing is the type information and the variable names just to make it more readable. And I would argue that these five lines of code that I've written are probably consumable or readable by most Go developers at almost every level. Even if you've only been in the language for a couple of weeks, I think you could look at this code and, and you have a fairly good idea or understanding of what the code is doing. And if I wanted to now do this with a slice of floating point numbers, well, I'm gonna to have to copy and paste this function, one of them, and rewrite type and, and, and rename variables, and I can do it, right? But from a readability perspective, from being able to comprehend this from a large number of Go developers, um, we have that with this code. So one of the first questions I asked myself as I started to learn the draft syntax was, well, this is great. I can write a third function for the floating point numbers, but is there a way to consolidate at least these two functions maybe into a single function um, where maybe the management of the code could, could be eased and we could still have this kind of same syntax and readability? And the answer to that question was we can. I can here on line 35 write a print function that uses the empty interface to accept that slice of int or string or eventually that slice of flow, right? The empty interface puts no constraint on the data that we can pass into this function. So it allows us to write this generic function 
to work with a slice of any type. And you can see here that I'm using type assertions, the type assertion mechanic here in a switch to be able to do conditional logic to determine, well, is this a slice of int? Is this a slice of string? And then I can use my traditional four range linear traversal to perform the actual work. Now, this isn't really a generic function, right? Because if I want to work with a slice of float, I have more code to write. I have to add another case statement. So really all I've done here is been able to consolidate the two functions that I wrote before into a single function um, using type assertions. So the question then that, that I asked myself was, well, is there a way to write a generic function a pure generic function in Go today where I can handle that slice of float without having to write any more code? And the answer was, yes, there is. Uh, I can leverage the reflect package. And so on line 56, I wrote a print function using the reflect package that can perform that linear traversal, not just over a slice of int and string, but also that floating point number, right? And so I, I continue to leverage the empty interface to accept that slice of any type. I use the uh, reflect API value of to get a reflect value that I can ask questions about at runtime. And one of the very first questions I have to ask is, is this even a slice, right? Because we're not creating any constraint on what the data is that can be passed in. This function also changes the semantics a little bit because um, since there's no guarantee that there is a slice being passed in, we do have to do some form of error handling that the original print functions aren't providing, which I'm not doing here. So the semantics change a little bit, but once I know that I do have a slice, I can't use my traditional for range loop, but I can increment I and using the reflect package API again, um, uh, do that linear traversal over each index, use the interface method there and display the value regardless of the type. And I have written a generic version of print. Now, let's make a couple of assessments here though, right? This code is drastically different from the code I wrote here uh, when I was working with the concrete types directly. Here are five lines of code that I, that I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe that the majority of Go developers, even those that are just in the language for a couple of weeks can read and comprehend this code. The use of the traditional four range mechanics um, makes that possible as well. And when we look at the generic function I wrote with the reflection package, I mean, the, the, the complexity is added, right? I, I can't make the same statement that all, that, that the majority of Go developers at almost any level can comprehend this code. It's now an API driven uh, piece of code. And I even I had to look up the reflect API to, to look at this. Now, another big reason why this function works as a generic version of print is because the print function also is using reflection, right? The print function from the font package is a generic function. It can output a value of, of any type with, with default formatting, but it, but it can, and I'm leveraging that. So we went from five lines of code to about eight. We went with a little bit more complexity on an API that we all have to learn. But, 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 but I, I do have a generic version of print that will work and we'll run that and we'll see it. So now the question becomes, well, is there value in being able to write a generic function of print where I could still leverage the code I wrote that's based on an actual concrete type? And, and the answer to that would be, would we be able to get back to writing code that can be consumed by more Go developers? And I think the answer is yes, I think there's value in being able to do that if we're gonna be able to uh, help with increase the comprehension and readability of the code we're writing. And so on line 75, I have a version of that print function that is leveraging the new syntax for generics in Go. Now, one of the things I'm gonna do, and you're gonna see me doing throughout the presentation is kind of removing that syntax to begin with. I'm doing that just to get it out of our way for a second so I can understand, I, I, at least I could teach to you why we need that or something similar um, in order to help the compiler. So essentially, if you look at this function right now on line 75, 
What I'm trying to do is tell the compiler that I would like to write these five lines of code that can work with a slice of any type T, of some type T, where T is not a type to be defined by me or going to be predefined, but a type to be determined at compile time. And the fact that T will be a concrete type. Because if T is a concrete type, then I can write these same five lines of code. I don't need the reflect API. We just know that this code will work with a value of any given type T. Now the problem with the syntax right now, just laying out T, is that the compiler is assuming with this syntax through backwards compatibility, that somewhere in some source code file, not necessarily this one, some programmer is gonna define a type named T, maybe like this. And so the compiler is assuming that when you hit that build button, that there, somewhere there is a type named T defined in some way that is valid for this print function. And this is the absolute opposite of what we want. This is not about us defining T. This is about T being defined at compile time. At the time we hit the build button, what should T be? And this is why we need a new syntax because this will never pass compilation. So the current syntax choice right now in the draft, to be able to tell the compiler that this identifier T is going to be a generic type, that T is going to be a type to be determined at compile time and don't go looking for it anywhere because you're not gonna find it, is to use a set of square brackets right after the function name using the keyword type and then naming that identifier, that generic type identifier, anything you want. And then that tells the compiler that don't look for T to be defined anywhere. T is going to be a generic type related to this function. And we'll figure out what T is at compile time. This is the current syntax right now that is being experimented with in the draft. And I want you to understand why we need this. Again, is to tell the compiler what T this T is. Now, this identifier can be anything. It can be a long name, short name, lowercase letters. It's up to you. And we do need some guidelines and idioms around this. But you're going to see for the code that I'm sharing with you that when I start to talk about collections, a slice of some type T, I like using the single letter names. But if you go look at other code I have in the repo, when I'm dealing with something that's specific to a result type or specific to an input, I might use a longer name. But this is an area where we've got to come up with some guidelines at some point. I also want to share with you, um, and you won't be seeing me do it, at, uh, you won't be seeing me use this alternative syntax during the presentation. But the original draft did use parentheses here first um, to get off, off the ground. And because of the parentheses, the use of the keyword type became important. This is still supported by the, the go to go tooling in the draft. So it's something you can experiment with. Also, now that they've switched to hard brackets, you don't necessarily need the keyword type anymore either. Now, I like the keyword type for some reason. I feel more comfortable with it. It's helping me in terms of readability. So you're going to see me continue to use it. But these are some of the decisions that we have to make at some point in the next few months to kind of zero in on the syntax. So you're going to see me using hard brackets. You're going to see me using this letter T or single letters for this presentation. And you're going to see me using the keyword type inside those brackets to just make it clear that T is a generic type to be determined at compile time, but it will be a concrete type. And so we can write code as if T is an int, if T is a string, if T is a float. And when we can write that code, that's going to be more readable, more comprehensible by, I believe, more Go developers at different levels. Okay, great. So we're kind of seeing that first syntax right here. We're trying to, starting to understand why we need a new syntax. Let's run some of this code through the transpiler just so we can see it run. And what I'm doing on line 86 is constructing that slice of integers or 92, constructing a slice of strings. And I'm passing that slice to all four of those functions that we have um, with the idea that we should get the same output. 
Now, if I switch over to the terminal window and I switch over to 01 basic here, you'll see that the source code file has a dot go to extension and that's for the go to go tool. So again, I'm not running 115 right now. I'm running a version that I built and you're going to see me switch over to now saying go tool, go to go. Uh, I'm going to tell the go to go tool that I want it to run this source code file, which means it will transpile it into a go file, build it and then run it. And if I do that, we see here that we're executing that code again. It's being transpiled. We don't have an actual implementation of this just yet. But the cool part is that what we can now do is construct maybe that slice of floats. Right? We'll just put some decimal points here. Doesn't matter what they are. And I don't have a print float number. I can't do that. I don't print a cert doesn't have that case that we need. But as I said, the reflect code is already a generic function using the reflect package. So we should see those floating point numbers. And the generic function, the whole idea is that we could also pass that slice of float. And now T will become a slice of float 64 and the function will be supported. So if I do that and we go back and we run it, you can see here that we're now displaying those floating point numbers and I didn't have to write any more code to do that. Now, there's a couple more things here that I have to share before we move on to the next example. This um, list right here, this type list of generic types is not only a way of telling the compiler that T is something that needs to be defined at compile time, but it's also really a parameter list of types as well. In other words, I can explicitly, and in some cases we may need to, pass the information about what T is going to be. Before when I ran the code, we were getting lucky, maybe not lucky, but the compiler was capable of inferring what type T was going to be based on the input, right? Because T is being used in the first, for the first parameter, the compiler is able to look at what you're passing as the first parameter and then infer that T is going to be an int, T is going to be a float, T is going to be a string. But there may be times where the compiler can't infer T. Why wouldn't it be able to? Because you're using T in the body of the function and not using it anywhere, let's say, as a parameter. That could potentially happen. In which case now, we're gonna be explicit on the generic function call and tell the compiler, here, this is what T is going to be, and it gets that information now at compile time. So I can build that with the explicit passing of the type information for T, but ideally what we really want is any time that the compiler can infer the type, this is what we would prefer. So a function call to generic here would be no different than any other function call that we were making. And again, when T is used in that parameter list, then it opens up the uh, ability of the compiler to infer the type. Okay, great. So we've just seen our first uh, use of the new syntax in writing a generic function. Great. Now, if you're going to be writing any real world applications, well, data structures are, are really important. And they're going to, there's going to come a time where we're going to want to write data structures that are also generic. So let me show you um, two examples around these generic data structures. Let's start with this one right here. And I want to walk through the same progression with you as I just did. So look on line 11. On line 11, I'm defining a user-defined type, a name type called vector in. And I'm trying to define maybe some special functionality around a vector. And this particular vector is bound to working with integers. And you can see here that I've defined this new type. And because I've defined the new type, then on line 13, I begin to add some special behavior like push. 
And I use my value semantic mutation API, very similar to what a pen does, where we're gonna have our own copy of the vector, we'll push some value of an int into it, and then we'll return that new modified vector back out. And in this particular case, we use a pen to perform that operation. And if I wanted to write a vector that worked with a with strings, well, I can basically copy this code, define a vector string, change out the int to a string, and push really is identical outside of the fact that we're gonna be working with strings. Now, if I wanted to now create a vector of that floating point number, you already know what I have to do. Copy, paste, change out string to float everywhere, and I, and I have it. Now, what's really allowing this code to be so similar as well is the use of the built-in function pen. And when you think about it, you know, Go really already has generics. I, I've kind of shown that already with the reflect package. But these built-in functions into the language, append, copy, delete, make, new, they're really generic functions as well. Look, append can take a slice of any given type and a value of the same type and perform that operation for us. That's, that's why we're writing such little code here. And I can make the claim that Go has generics, especially around the built-in functions, but I have to be honest about that, right? The mechanics that the language team gets to use to write these generic functions is not extended to us. The, there's some special mechanics that they have access to that we don't. But none, nonetheless, these are generic functions that I'm leveraging here to be able to write these methods all the same. So then I go back to, okay, is there a way to do this in a generic way, the current version of Go? And the answer is, well, I can always go back to using the empty interface. There it is, a vector, uh, a slice of empty interface. And if you notice the implementation of push, again, because append is a generic function, the implementation is identical. Now, Again, let's be honest here. This vector of the empty interface type actually has a different semantic than the vector of type string. Because when we talk about these vectors, these vectors are bound to a single type of data. The implementation was fairly straightforward thanks to append. Their usability is also straightforward because we always know that we're gonna be working with integers or strings. When it comes to the empty interface vector, the semantic changes because I can now interlace different data values into this one vector. Yep, I can put floating points in there now, I can, but I can also put integers and I can also put strings. And so though the implementation is, as, you know, is, is the same complexity, let's say, as this push for string, the usability is where the complexity now comes in because if you are iterating over this vector and you need to know what the concrete type is, we're back to doing type assertions. And so the usability of this vector, um, I, I think is more complicated and the semantics are changing. So how could we write a generic vector where we get that same usability of knowing that it's just of a single type um, where, the complexity, let's say, is the same in the implementation. Well, here it is again, thanks to append, right? So in this particular case, again, I'm gonna get rid of this. What we're trying to do is tell the compiler that I want my vector to be of a slice of some type T, T to be determined at compile time. There we are again, where T is a generic type to be determined at compile. How do we tell the compiler that that is what T is? We use our square brackets attached to the right-hand side of that function, in this case, of the type name. And now we're telling the compiler once again, don't expect me to define T or don't expect T to be defined anywhere. By the time we hit build, T has to be determined at compile time and we'll figure out what T is then. Now, when you look at the method implementation, specifically the receiver, I want you to notice that this isn't just vector generic, that's not enough. 
we're always dealing with a vector generic of some type t as the receiver. We're returning a vector generic of some type t, right, of type t, and we're accepting a value of type t. Because append is already a generic function, it can work with t, um, which will be determined at compiled time anyway. So you're seeing where we're now defining a user-defined type where the underlying type here is a slice of some type t. And you can see how that type goes along with its syntax. All right, let's take a look at running this so we can get a better kind of visual on it. So on line 56 and 63, I'm constructing my vector of that specific concrete type. Here it is, vector n set to its zero value. I'm pushing integers into there because the push method is defined with int. I get to work with my for range loop over the vector. And to show the usability here, since I know that every value in this vector is an integer on the generic print call, I can be specific with the percent %d format specifier and I'll have no issues. We know that d is always going to be an int. Same thing with the string. We always know that as we iterate over this vector, it's always gonna be a string. I can use the format specifier here with no issues. Now, I told you before, you know, the semantics change with our vector interface, because as you can see, I can interlace different values into this vector, including floating points right now. And if I want to work with the specific format specifier, that's important, I'm back to doing those type assertions. And this is why I said that though the implementation of vector interface is the same as the other implementations, the usability gets more complex because we're back to type assertions if you need to know exactly what type of data is in any given index position. Okay, now what about our, our generic vectors? Well, look on line 82 here because here's our construction call to that zero value. But remember, this is a generic type where we need to determine what t is at compile time. And in this particular case, there's nothing that the compiler can leverage to be able to infer t. And so a lot of times when it comes to these user-defined types, we're gonna be using that syntax that I showed you before with those generic function calls and be explicit with what t is. So in this case, we're telling the compiler that t will be of type int, which means these methods will accept integers, which puts us back to being able to use a for range, knowing that every value is an int. Same thing here, we use the same type, but we specify t to be a string. Now we can push strings into that vector, we can perform our for range, and we are locked into our percent %s. And if I wanted to, I could copy and paste this now with no issues, right? say float 64, we make that a float, let's say. We can just change these three variables, I'll go to an F. I'm not writing any special code here, right? I'm just now using that implementation of my vector for now a float 64. And if we come in and look at running that, you can see here that on the generic side, we're able now to handle ints, strings, and floats specifically without the need of type assertions because there's no way to interlace that data into a single vector. So we're seeing here how we can define a type um, where there's a generic component to it. In this case, the underlying type is that slice of some type T. But what about struct types, right? I mean, a bulk of our code is gonna be using struct types. And then what about our data semantics around value and pointer semantics? How does all that play in with this draft and the new syntax? Um, well, let's go and take a look. Now, I wanted to give us a little bit more of a kind of practical look at code here with our struct types. And so I thought that defining some sort of container type like a linked list would be valuable here. 
And once again, like you are gonna be seeing me doing for the next hour, I'm gonna get rid of the generic syntax so we can look at these types first and then apply the new syntax that we need. And ideally with our linked list, the idea is that we wanna construct a node where we can store a value of any concrete type T to be determined at compile time. Because the bulk of the code we're gonna write for a linked list is the same, really regardless of the data that you're storing in this data structure. So the idea again here is that we want to be able to store any sort of data in this node to be determined at compile time. And since T is going to be a generic type, we go back and against the name of this new type, we apply our new syntax with the brackets type T. And this now tells the compiler that T will be determined at compile time. And you can notice now that when we create our next and previous pointer, this is a double linked list, that we are pointing to a node of some type T to be determined at compile time. A node of some type T, the same T, to be determined at compile time. Our list type follows the same exact syntax, right? This is our first and last pointer into the linked list where T is a type to be determined at compile time. So you see that similar syntax for both of these struct types. And then just so we can add some code to this linked list, we added a me add method. Now, once again, anytime we're dealing with a generic type, Right, we're gonna see that list of some type T, returning a node of some type T. And you can also see that we're using our pointer semantics, that's a pointer receiver, returning a pointer of node of some type T, where we're accepting a value of some type T as the input. Now, in this particular case on line 26, we're constructing a node of some type T. We're not being explicit here because this is an implementation detail inside of add where we don't know what T is um, just yet. And so you can see the construction of node T where before you saw me doing something like this and eventually we, we need to do something at some point like with list here. But in this particular case, T is gonna be constructed there. And then the rest of this is wiring up first and last um, and next and previous pointers. Okay, um, and so we now have our add method. Now, what I've decided to do is define another struct type named user, which is the data that we'll store in this linked list. And then if you look on line 53, I'm gonna construct a list where T will be explicitly set to a value of type user. So we're gonna use our value semantics here and say that this list stores values of type user, which means that the add method for list also accepts values of type user. And if I display the data that we're storing, we'll see values of type user coming out. And to show you that we're able to use our pointer semantics here on line 59, I say note T now is a pointer of type user, which means that the add method now only accepts pointers of type user. You can see the construction to the address. And in these cases here, we'll see that the data is not a value, but the address of a user. And if I were to build and run this code, you can see here values of type user, addresses of type user. And right now we're giving the user the ability to choose the semantics that they want for the data that they wanna store. Now, you could restrict the usability of this code. You could say, regardless of what is passed or regardless of what is explicitly provided for T, I want to use pointer semantics. You could restrict the pointer semantics for data and for that parameter on line 25. Now, if I were to build the code again right now with that one change, you'll start to see messages because we have type mismatches in these calls um, because the compiler is now assuming not just pointer or you know uh, the address of user. Now it's even double in direction on the other call. I'll show you that. Because here 
we're saying T is of type user. We hard coded pointer semantics for the data, both in the node and the add, which is now going to be forcing us to use addresses of type user here. And in this particular case now, where we've said T is a pointer of type user, because we hard coded the pointer semantics, now it's double indirection. I'm not even going to try to get that to work. But you can see here now, when we do that, I think you're kind of handcuffing the usability, the user, creating a usability problem here, where you know we're looking at user, and now suddenly we're, we're passing those pointer semantics. It could make it a little bit more difficult to read. You're not allowing the user in this case to decide if they want to use pointer semantics or not. And so I just kind of want to share that with you when you start dealing with these types of data structures, if it's critically important to the integrity of the data structure that these things are pointers, then yeah, I would say that you probably want to hard code them here. You're not putting stars here. Remember, this is just a type identifier to say that T is a generic type. Um, but I think it's nice from the usability standpoint when it's practical to do so, to let the user decide whether or not they want to work with their value semantics or their pointer semantics, and it will keep things, um, I think, more readable. But I wanted to share that with you. These are, these are some things that you might run into as you begin to uh, experiment with some of your own code, whether it's a personal project or at work, and you start thinking about those pointer semantics and those value semantics. But it's nice to leave T open, I believe, when it's reasonable to do so, giving the uh, user the ability to find whether T is a pointer or a value of some given type. All right, so we've, it's, let's see, it's almost 20 minutes after the hour. I got 20 more minutes, that's good. Um, we've seen now the use of a generic function. We've seen the use of a generic type where it's an underlying type. I've shown you now the use of a generic struct type and I've shared with you um, the, the ideas of value and pointer semantics um, as well. Now let's get back to our generic functions for a second, because um, a lot of the code that we write, a lot of the functions that we write um, are not gonna be able to accept data of any given type because we're gonna be performing operations against that data that are gonna require some constraint. And there's really two types of constraints here that we have to think about. There's behavioral constraint, and then there's what I'm gonna call property constraint. So let's start with that behavioral constraint. And what I'm gonna do here is go ahead and define two types, two struct types, one named user, which has a name and email, and one named customer on line 22 that has a name and email. And I want you to look on line 18 because what I'm doing is defining a method using value semantics, a named string that returns a string. Essentially what this method is doing, it's allowing me to stringify a user into some sort of string format, which in this case I'm using um, JSON, right? I've hard-coded JSON as the stringified version of a user. And I've done the same thing for customer. I'm stringifying a customer. And if I were to add another entity type, then the behavior around how to stringify that belongs to it through that method string. Okay, now what if I had a collection of users and a collection of customers that I wanted to stringify all in a group? Well. Here's um, two functions that could perform that operation. So on line 38, I wrote a stringify users function. It takes a slice of users and returns a slice of strings, which is the stringified version of all those users. We construct the return slice based on the number of users we have. We perform our traditional for range. And the big thing here is calling the string method that we know exists because we know the compiler knows that string method was defined and we're able to stringify all these users 
into that second slice of strings. Again, it's five lines of code. And I would, I would make a big argument here that um, a lot of Go developers at almost every level could fairly quickly read and comprehend this code and what it's doing. And when it comes to stringifying customers, all we're really changing out is the type information. We, we know that a customer, just like a user, has a string method, which is providing the actual stringification implementation that we need for this code. It's the same five lines of code. We just changed some variable names and the type information. And if I had another entity, here it is again, Bill, copy this function, change out variable names and type information, and there we go. And so we go back to, is there a way to do this all in one function in the current version of Go? And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. Here it is again. We could use our type assertions with the empty interface, and we could type assert again. And if it's a slice of user or slice of customer, there we are, we're consolidating those functions into one. But again, it's not a generic function. Uh, I'd have to add another case statement. So the question then is, can I use the reflect package today to truly write a generic version of stringify? And the answer is yes, except instead of requiring five lines of code, we're up to 13 lines of code. And um, this code is very hard to just kind of scan read and comprehend. And again, it also has some different semantics, right? You saw this before, uh, reflect value of, is it a slice if it's not? Well, here we are returning nil. We really don't have that semantic in the concrete versions. We're able to construct a slice of strings of the right length. We can't use our for range, but we can iterate over i. And then doing some research with the API for the reflect package, I was able to detect if there is a method named string, and again, some differences in semantics because I, there's no guarantee that this method will exist, even if we have a slice of some type. But if the method does exist, I can call it, which we need to because that's where the real intelligence is for the stringification. And then I need one more string method here on the append. And you can see here in 13 lines of code, I did write with some changes in semantics a generic version of stringify. And trust me, I had to look up the reflect package API to make this work. Trust me, as I look at it now, I do have to kind of break it down the way I did with you. So just staring at it isn't enough where I'm gonna read and comprehend it. So we go back to, is there a way where we can leverage generics to write this function without the need of the reflect package? and essentially get back to those same five lines of code, right? When we can get back to the code that we're writing for a particular concrete type, that code is gonna be more comprehensible and more readable than having to leverage the reflect package. Now, I love the reflect package. This is not, uh, I, I love it. When it comes to marshalling and unmarshalling, when it comes to data validation, I still think the reflect package is gonna be the right tool. I'm a big fan of the reflect package. But there are cases today in code where we're leveraging the empty interface type assertions and reflect uh, where the code gets more complex, where I think we can reduce it. And once again, here's our generic version. I'm gonna get rid of a couple of things here, again, just so we can break it down. And once again, what we're looking at is, I wanna write a function that can work with a slice of any type T to determine a compile time. I don't care if it's an int, a string, or a float. The idea is I get back to the same five lines of code that I wrote before. Four. Now, since T is a generic type, we come back in and we add that. We tell the compiler, yeah, 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 T is a generic type to be determined at compile time. We know that. But we have a problem right now with this code, and it happens to be on line 114. See, line 114 is assuming that whatever value is of some type T that it has this string behavior. And there's nothing here right now in the code we've written that gives the compiler any guarantee that a value of type T must have the behavior string. What we do is we have a problem here. We need a way of defining a constraint, a behavioral constraint. Now, when you think about Go today, we really already have a mechanic for this we already have interfaces. 
And an interface is a way of defining a method set of behavior that we are demanding a value of any given type exhibits in order to be used in what I'll call a traditional polymorphic function. So I could write a function today that looks like this, right? Where the fump package has an interface called stringer, which says that a value must exhibit the behavior where there is a method named string that returns a string, which is essentially the behavior I've implemented for user and customer. This is what I call our traditional polymorphic function. This is a function that's not asking for data based on what it is, right? This is a function that's asking for the concrete data based on what it is. It's saying, I want a user value. It's asking for data based on what it can do, the constraint being on the behavior. Now this function is saying, I will accept a value or pointer of any type as long as it knows how to string, right? It's a constraint and the compiler, compile time can validate on any function call to Bill that the data we're passing in exhibits the full method set of behavior defined by Stringer. So this idea of defining a constraint, specifically a behavioral constraint, is not foreign in Go. We use it for our traditional polymorphic functions. And we really have the same problem here. We are saying that for whatever type we substitute for T, values of that type better be able to exhibit this behavior named string. And so what the compiler, or I'm not the compiler, the current draft says, let's leverage the same interface um, mechanics that we use today for our traditional polymorphic functions for defining behavioral constraints on our generic functions. So what you're now seeing me do is say type T, T is going to be a generic type to be defined at compile time. And by the way, compiler, by the way, please make sure that whatever type we substitute for T, that that type and the values of that type conform to the stringer interface, that, that the data for type T has a, the full method set of behavior defined by stringer. It's really the same thing we're doing with our traditional polymorphic functions, but we're doing it here now in our generic functions at that type, type level. There we are. And now with this, the compiler will say, okay, you're defining a constraint of fump stringer, which says that this string behavior must exist. You're now allowed to write this logic in on line 114 because we can now be rest assured that that string behavior will exist. We'll validate that again at compile time for whatever T is trying to be substituted for, but the constraint is now defined. Now, a type can only have, or a type identifier can only have one constraint. So you can't have a list of interfaces here that's not gonna work. So you might need to, in some cases, compose a larger interface from those smaller ones if you have um, different methods that need to be supported. It's honestly not really any different than your traditional polymorphic functions where the behavior it goes beyond maybe just one method. Now, let's take a look how this all works. So you can see here again, I'm constructing a slice of user values, constructing a slice of customer values. I'm able to pass them to all four of my different functions. Um, I can come back over here. You can run it. We see the pretty print or the stringified versions of those types. Now, I'm not going to define another entity type. We got that. We know how that works. Uh, what I am going to do is remove this constraint, which is going to cause a problem, not just to the compiler, but even your tooling, because your tooling won't even know that T um, can have a method of type string here, right? We, we, won't, we won't even know that. And the compiler won't know that either. I wanna show you the compiler message that we're getting now today. They've worked really well on the compiler messages to help. That's something else that they're working on and formulating with the GoToGo -Go tooling. And you can see here that the compiler came back and said value string undefined 
uh, type bound for T has no method string. So you can see that the compiler is saying, look, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not telling me that T is gonna be bound to uh, any of that behavior. Now that we put the constraint back in, um, it all works. So um, as again, part of the draft here is to leverage interfaces um, like we do today for our traditional polymorphic functions to work with these generic functions when a constraint on behavior is required. Now, something that we have with our generic functions that we don't have with our traditional polymorphic functions is sometimes the constraint isn't behavioral, it's really based on specific operations that we wanna perform on the data. So let me show you what I mean by that. And to do that, I kind of want to just start on line 16, if we can, again, removing this. I really, I can, it really helps me, at least early on, to remove the, um, the, the, the generic new syntax when I'm looking at the code, just because my brain right now is still wired on this syntax, right? And I want you to look on line 16, because what I'm really trying to do is write a function that says, given a value of type T and a second value of type T, let's add those two values together and return a third value of type T. And again, T is going to be a type that is generic. So we put back our syntax there, right? And now we know that T is to be defined at compile time, but here is that other problem. We're using the plus operator here against the values of type T. And this isn't really a behavioral constraint issue in the sense that we're working with methods. This is for me more of a property of the data. Not all data that we can define and substitute for T can be used in this operation on line 17. You can't add two struct values together. You can't add two slice values together. So we are back to this situation where we need to define a constraint for T for those types that can work with a plus operator, right? And now this gets a little tricky because we don't have this mechanic just yet in the language. So in the current draft that we, the current draft specification um, for today, the current idea is to continue to leverage the interface for the constraint mechanic, but to define a list of types that will um, give us the constraint we need for the operation, in this case, the plus operation that we're attempting or that we need to perform. And so that type list now says that if you call add, then the only data that you can pass must be of these types or underlying types. I wanna get that straight. I could define a type named Bill with an underlying type of string and Bill would still be compliant with the constraint. Yes, I could put Bill in this list, but since Bill has an underlying type of string, Bill is already um, conforming to the constraint. I want you to be aware of that. And now we know, the compiler knows now that, yep, we'll make sure that only these types can work with that, right? If I did a subtraction here, now string would have to be taken out. We can't subtract two strings, right? But we can add them. So it's a complex uh, situation for the compiler and, and it's something new, probably the very first thing I'm showing you that's kind of new coming into the language. Now, I'm gonna tell you a couple things here. Um, the language team that's working on this has expressed some concern about this part of the draft. And primarily because um, we're still using the keyword interface. We're still defining an interface type here. But the problem now is, is that once an interface has a type list, it can no longer be used in a traditional polymorphic function. It doesn't 
really makes sense to be used in a traditional polymorphic function. And that kind of breaks a little bit of what we kind of know and love about Go, where everything's, you know, where you define an interface, it should be usable everywhere the way we're using it today and, and moving forward. And suddenly now you've defined an interface that can't be used in a traditional polymorphic function. The compiler won't allow that. So the language team is looking at, is spending time right now on alternatives to this type of constraint. And they're open to any ideas you might have um, as well. But it is quite possible that there are no better ideas come a year, a year and a half from now, and this is what ends up sticking in a first release of generics for Go. So if you're looking at this and you're like, ah, I mean, you're not alone, but do appreciate that there is a constraint that does have to be applied so we can guarantee that only types that do support this plus operator are um, allowed. Okay, um, let me show you some more ideas here though. Um, another idea in the draft is this idea of these pre-declared type constraints. So we don't have to, as a community, all have to re-implement, right? This is where the built-in functions came in, right? The idea of the built-in functions was that everybody was going to eventually have to write their own append function. Why are we having everyone do that? So these pre-declared um, type constraints like comparable would um, be provided. So if you were performing an operation like line 21, where you're comparing uh, these two variables of some type T, um, that you wouldn't have to define a special interface for that. So um, there's some ideas around pre-declared type constraints to help with this and potentially um, to help with this as well, if it's possible. Now, the very last thing I wanna show you here um, is this code right here. And what I want to share here is just kind of one more form of all of this. And what I'm going to do is remove um, these two things for a second. Now, I want you to look at this function match on line 74. What am I trying to do? Again, I'm trying to say that I will accept a slice of some type T and a value of some type T. We will perform that linear traversal over the slice of some type T. I will call the match method against that value of type T, passing in a value of type T find. And if it's true, I'll return the index we're at or I'll return negative one. It's a way of trying to figure out where does this match in some collection. But this code again assumes that there's a behavioral constraint on T for match behavior. So what do we know already? We know that since T is a generic type, we need this syntax against the function name. We also know now that since there's behavior here that we have to perform a constraint on, I need an interface. And in this case, we're gonna call that interface the matcher interface. There we are. Now, the matcher interface is interesting here because this is gonna have to be an interface leveraging a generic type. You see, match is got, has to be a generic method that accepts a value of some type T to be determined at compile time. And so what you see in the match declaration here is that we define matcher to be a generic interface type of some type T that is used as the parameter to the match behavior that returns bool. And now we're in compliant with the behavioral constraint. Now, the other thing that I got rid of here was this. You can today in the current draft define an interface that has not just um, method behavioral constraint like match, but also could define a type list. Now, in this particular case, um, defining the type list um, doesn't really seem to make much sense or is needed because in this particular function that I wrote, um, this is the only constraint that we have, right? I'm not writing code in here that looks like, let's say this, or anything where we're gonna be specific to person and food. And I've had a really hard time 
finding a reason to have an interface that would have both a behavioral constraint and a typeless constraint. But in the last meetup that I gave, somebody had an interesting idea where they were working in a high compliant piece of software and in another language. And one of, they thought that one nice idea here could be in, in guaranteeing at compile time that only certain data values could run through a particular function that had, let's say, a high security or required something from a regulatory standpoint. So somebody couldn't just pass anything through. Um, you could restrict a, a set of data through some, say, sort of regulatory function um, and get that at compile time. I thought that was super interesting, all right? That is kind of super interesting. And, and maybe that's more of a side effect to what we're trying to accomplish here. But I did want you to know that you could combine these two. And right now, the only practical use that I've even heard of could be in a regulatory environment where you're saying, I only want um, person and food values to ever be used across this function because we have some sort of regulatory constraint where somebody can't write a behavior for match that's, say, empty and always works, right, for something else. So that's kind of interesting. The only other thing I want to share real quick, real quick, is you can have um, multiple um, identifiers listed out in the type list. However, once one identifier has an interface um, or a constraint, they all must have a constraint. So you might see in some code the use of the empty interface as a constraint um, for a generic type. You will only see this when there's a list of more than one type and one of them requires uh, an actual constraint. It's a constraint that doesn't constrain, right? So you might see that in code. We don't need it right now. I haven't done anything where there was multiple. There are examples in the remaining set here where you'll see some of that, all right? The only other thing I haven't shared with you is the returns. There's some interesting experiments that I'm doing in returns, especially with return types and zero value. I'm going to leave that up to you because we are out of time with this. But I was at least able to share with you a bulk of, this, of the new syntax, why we need it, what's happening there. Um, and hopefully you feel a little bit more kind of comfortable now in, in, in what is being looked at in terms of a first release of generics. Just a first release, uh, it doesn't mean that, that the things that you're seeing on the emissions list may never get in two or three years from now. Um, but at least what it looks like today is this draft is looking at ways of uh, reducing the need of the empty interface type assertions and reflection to write generic code that can be um, I think more comprehensible and easier to read by more Go developers. And we're going to see a big use of that in those kind of container types in places where you're using those constructs today. And I'm hoping to see, you know, potential changes in the standard library with the sync package. Uh, maybe we finally get some concurrency um, packages in the standard library where we can all now kind of standardize on how we do fan ins and fan outs and pooling and and these types of things, it could be it could be interesting. All right, so that's my, and I went three minutes over, so I apologize, so that's it. So at this point, I can take any sort of questions or comments. If you wanna provide a comment, all I'm gonna do is ask that you keep it down to one to two minutes tops, so we can get everybody in who wants to um, share something. And again, the very last thing I wanna do is remind everybody of the links here and the Google survey. And please, if you have anything to share, any thoughts or, or any ideas, use that Google survey to do that. Natalie, Thank you very much, Bill. I will change the settings so that people will be able to unmute themselves, but I can say that there were a lot of questions in the chat and a lot of conversation going on. Perfect. Uh, would you like to, for Ollie and me to read the questions for you, or should we just say that people will step in and speak? What would you prefer? I'd prefer if somebody steps in and speaks so I can just talk to them directly. And sometimes the context is better when it's 
said okay. instead of written. Then everybody is able to unmute them yourself. Somebody feel free to okay. unmute and start the conversation. One thing that I've been doing, Natalie, um, this is a larger group. So maybe we keep it down to one minute if you really have something to say. Uh, it's just kind of like walking through the list of everybody that's here, like Chris, you have anything you want to ask or say, you got a minute, go. And we can just maybe quickly walk through. I would just have everybody just understand that we're 28 people. So um, we just keep it really short. But I am interested in what people have to say and their thoughts and ideas. I don't know if you want to do that. Um, sure. I was I was just wondering. You showed the um, difference. Be, um, I think it was example three where you had a T and pointer to T. Um, and my first impression would be if you if you say pointer to T, uh, that would make it a pointer to pointer to T. Yeah, that's absolutely the message that I got in the compiler was I now had double indirection because since this was a pointer of type T coming in, this was a pointer to a pointer of type T. Exactly. Okay. Exactly right. So I think that's why when it's reasonable, let the you know, user define the data semantic. But there may be cases where using value semantics is just gonna be an absolute no-no. You know they're gonna have problems. And so you kind of, you, you potentially force the pointer semantics on them. Make sense? All right. Uh, I don't know, Anderson, do you have anything you'd like to question and or comment? If you have nothing, don't say anything. I, I can just move quickly. Martin? Uh, Flower, you have anything you'd like to share, add, question? Yes, uh, Chris, uh, uh, sorry, um, Russ Cox wrote uh, that, uh, let's get the quotation. Uh, the problem with gener generic dilemma is this, do you want slow programmers, slow compilers and bloated binaries or slow execution times? So my question is, are we going to get slow uh, compilers and slow execution times? Okay, so here's the thing. None of that work has been decided yet. I'm sure they're thinking about it, but right now they're still just focused on language syntax choice. And just to add a little clarity to that, okay, uh, and what helped me kind of understand that. Um, when it comes time to actually implementing this in the compiler, um, there are trade-offs that they have to make. Here's two potential possibilities that they can make, okay? They could choose to do what they're currently doing right now in the transpiler and write a very specific concrete version of say that function and that type for every substitution that they have. Now that would lend itself to performance for that code, right? And potentially the reduction of allocations depending on escape analysis, but it's gonna blow the the amount of code that's there and that could slow down compilation. The opposite of that is they could leverage the same mechanics they have today for let's say the append function. And they could write a single function for each generic function for all types. Now that probably wouldn't be as performant or you wouldn't have the escape analysis abilities, right? To reduce allocations, but it would definitely speed up compilation because they only have to and keep your binary small because they only have to write <laughs> one function. So I don't know if they've even made any decisions on that yet. I'm sure they're talking about it, but I can, I, I don't know. And I haven't really poked them yet because we still have these syntax questions like the type lists and some other things. So I have no idea what direction they're going to go in, um, but it will be interesting when they make that decision. Until then, we don't know. No, I, I do have a question. They dropped the idea of contracts, right? Yes. And so uh, a mix of what's your opinion? Would it be good to have something different than interface that could just leave the types or 
a contract that will be this interface with type that only works with generics. So then you can separate and avoid people literally misusing and making this odd interface that now is constraining the behavior to specific types. When it, become, when it comes to behavioral constraint, I like the use of the interface in both places because that's the mechanic we have today. If it can be determined that we don't need a mix of type lists and behavior, then I think you could define another thing for the type list and apply it. And then maybe we don't have that breaking interface change. Um, but what you can't have is um, something called a contract that looks and feels like an interface, but isn't used in interfaces. Because I can tell you right now, that's going to be impossible to teach and impossible to kind of draw the line in the sand. I'm really glad they got rid of contract because I was panicking over it because it looked like the interface and it, it was going to be way too difficult. Um, so I think where we need a lot of focus right now, I think one of the biggest, the, the biggest um, hurdle we have right now is that type list. And how do we apply that type of constraint um, maintaining the simplicity? Because this is complicated. Like think about the string. You can't, just somebody, somebody's idea was, well, instead of applying the type list in an interface, why don't we apply the operators in the, in the constraint list, right? So, so I'm not saying I agree with this, but um, somebody's idea was, can we do that, right? And that would, but what happens if you're supporting this and supporting that? And, you know, maybe it's very specific there and you know, but that runs into other problems now too. So I don't know what we're gonna do here, but I, I would prefer if we can find a solution that doesn't add another keyword. All right, that's my opinion. Um, and maybe the answer ends up being, we have to live with this and it breaks things. I don't know, I hope I answered your question, but I, I, I prefer to, Try to find a way to do this without introducing another, especially a type. Because the other problem with the, the, the contract for me was you didn't declare variables of that type. That breaks things, right? And but this is right now, this is, and I have no brain power to even think about this. Um, and I haven't seen any other ideas other than right now applying some potential operator. But Ian, if you, one of the things I do uh, every day, just about, at the end of the day, is I jump on Golang nuts because I can't handle the emails. There's just too many. And um, I don't know why it's not coming up. Um, I jump on this like every day, maybe at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, and I just look at anything coming in. So this is new. I haven't even looked at this, right? Um, and I kind of just kind of there and I look at what people are suggesting. So the idea of the operator kind of came from something I read earlier today. But um, if you want to kind of stay up with the debate, then this is something that you can do kind of on your own time and see where it's going. Uh, hopefully I answered your question. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Um, Johannes, do you have anything? You'd like to add questions, share. Rodrigo. Hola. Valerio. Thomas. Harold. Oh, I had Thomas Hauser and Thomas Rentkin. Fred. I'm gonna hurt your name here. Gorkum, I don't know how to pronounce, I apologize for that. Michael, Craig, Ricardo, Da, Sacha, Karam, L, T, Zane. All right, nobody wants to share anything. What else do I got here? HLGX. And I can't pronounce his last name. Erd, Erdnik, maybe. 
Well, that's it. I, I just went through everybody's name. So if anybody has any other questions or they'd like to share some thoughts on what I've shown you now is your time. Um, and if not, it would be really great for you to, if you have time, kind of look at your work projects or your personal projects, uh, maybe experiment a little bit and then give the Go team through that Google survey uh, as much feedback as, as you can. It will really help. I think that's it, Natalie. Yep, thank you very much for all the time. Yeah, I'm sure everybody learned a lot and uh, you are getting a round of applause now with the uh, emojis of the, in the participants list, so you can see that. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks again. I'm sure everybody knows your Twitter and already follows you. So if anything, people will reach out, of course. Yeah, and you know, if you, if you do um, start trying to experiment with the generics and you come up with some interesting ideas and thoughts, um, send me an email, share me the code. Maybe it's something I can put into the training repo and it's something that we can teach to. If you've got thoughts and you're just, and honestly, I'm this person, just too nervous to put it up on Go Nuts or in a, in a uh, GitHub issue, send them to me as well over email. I'll look at them and maybe I'll send them directly to the language team. Um, and then they may suggest at some point to put it up for public debate. Um, but I want to make sure everybody has the same opportunity to share their thoughts, ideas, and questions with the language team. So you can use me as a conduit for that. Thanks again. And I will invite, uh, I will stop the recording. <laughs>